Amen. Well, let's just pray before we come to the Word today. God, I just thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together today in your house. And God, we just pray as we come to your Word that you would speak to us, that we wouldn't, um, if there's any words of man, let them fall to the ground, that your Word rise up. Holy Spirit, go to work in people's lives. Bring correction where correction is needed. Bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. But God, let us glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen and Amen. Cool. How are we going in the soccer? It's finished now, isn't it? Is that right? We don't care about that anymore. We've moved on. We didn't even get a medal. My goodness. <clears throat> I wonder if they get a participation award. They probably would. I, I, I don't know, like everyone else. But hey, we're on a series at the moment called Healthy Church. And, um, and we're going to continue talking about that today. We've, been, we've launched this series out of Acts 2, talk, talking about when the, the New Testament church was birthed. And obviously, we're still living in that new covenant. We're still living uh, in what God, um, what the Holy Spirit did back then. We're still living today. We still have a mission as a church to go into the world and make disciples. Do we believe that? And so we see that in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. They go out, they preach. Thousands of people are added to the church. And at the end of Acts 2, we start to see the, the formation of the early church, the culture, the choices that they made. Um, and, and I believe that we today still need to contend and forge out a healthy culture that was set out back then. And we also need to make choices that we can continually be healthy because healthy things grow. You know, we started off in week one that health is about maturing. See, if something doesn't mature, it means it's unhealthy. There's something that's missing in it. But as we grow and mature and reach our potential, it's a, it's a sign of health. And so we spoke about that in, in week one. And, and, and I want us to remember that as we're talking on this topic, healthy church relates to everything that we do because you and I, we're the church. If we're healthy, we grow in, our, in every aspect of our life. And so we, we spoke about that. If we want to have healthy lives, week two we spoke about, we've got to have the right foundation. And that foundation is Jesus. We've got to repent, believe, and be baptized. If the foundation's right, our life is built on Jesus. We sung about it this morning. What a great song to sing about what we're talking about today. That as it's built on there, no matter what comes our way, we won't be blown away. We won't come crashing down because our life is built on Jesus. We've turned from our ways, we've believed, and we've gone through baptism, making that public declaration out of obedience to Christ, going through the water, symbolizing the death and resurrection. That's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives. We spoke all about that. And then we see that the church is formed out of this repentance, believe and be baptized. And then we see that they, they, they begin to pray. Last week, Mel spoke an amazing word. He was here last week. If you won't, you should repent and believe and be baptized again. Um, but we talk about prayer. Prayer is so powerful. So many times we, we think, oh, all I can do is pray. Man, if all you can do is pray, that's that's pretty good. Pray to the God of the universe, the one that, can, that created the heavens and the earth, the one that can make a way where there is no way. Mate, prayer shouldn't be just like the last thing we do. It's the first thing we do. We're praying and believing. You know what? After Father's Day, so in a couple of weeks, we're going to, as a church, go into a time of 21 days of prayer. And we're going to pray together as a church. We're going to believe for things. And we're going to... You know what prayer ultimately does? It realigns us back to what's important to God. Because our life, we become selfish. We start to live life just getting, getting, getting. But we've got to realize that our life isn't about what we can get, but about what we can give to those people around us. Encouragement, love, grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so today I want to speak for a few moments on the topic of discipleship. When we see this early church, when it was formed, it was a discipleship church. And every church should be about discipleship. Because that's pretty much what God has called us to do in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What did he say? He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And what a powerful promise, what a powerful uh, mission that Christ, that Jesus gave the church to do. Go and make disciples. Go and teach people the commands of Christ. Go and lead people to Jesus. 
I love it how it says there, therefore go. Because I believe that discipleship happens when we go. We, we, we sit, some people think it's about sitting and just doing a class and it can involve those things. But discipleship is about going. We are, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple of Christ. And the ultimate fruit of a disciple obviously is love, but disciples make disciples. We go and tell people about Jesus. See, I, I believe a faith worth having is a faith worth sharing. And we're all called to go and tell people about the good news about Jesus Christ. So a disciple, how, how do we disciple? It's about training, teaching, equipping, sending, and releasing. And we see that the early church is what they did, that they equipped, they, they, they gathered together, they were around the, the, the word of God, they were taught, they were sent to go and do great things for God. And I believe for us, in our life as a church, it's what the mandate is, where every church is called to do it. But even beyond that, we're called to disciple our families well, our children. Our ultimate responsibility as parents is to disciple our kids well. What's a disciple? That's what our mission statement here is in church, Mark 1:17. When Jesus called his first disciples, what did he say? He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So ultimately the signs of a disciple is somebody that follows Jesus is being changed by Jesus and is living out the mission of Jesus. When you say, follow me, I will make you become, which he changes them. And then it says, make them fishers of men, which is living out the mission of Christ. And so ultimately for us, if we want to keep building a healthy church, we're going to be focused on that. And that's why when we changed our name, when we tweaked our mission statement, I wanted our mission statement to be what we're really about, which is about making disciples. And wherever we go, we want to help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and live out the mission of Jesus. And I believe that should be the mission for your life personally as well, in everything that you do. Be pointing people to Jesus. So I want to give us a few things today on how, as we go through Scripture, we see how Jesus discipled. And uh, I'll just pull out a couple of points, and then um, we'll go and we'll have an amazing lunch together out in the deck, and... Um, Great time of fellowship out there, and uh, who's getting hungry already? Who missed breakfast today? Uh, no one, he did well, all right. So how did Jesus disciple? He obviously, he discipled as he went. He spent time with his disciples. But the first thing he did when he taught his disciples, he spoke in parables, which means he spoke in the language that they could understand. Sometimes as Christians, we can start to talk this thing called Christianese, and, uh, and, and people that don't know God or are in church don't understand what you're talking about. So when we're discipling and when we're telling people about Jesus, when we're helping them be, be followers of Jesus or being changed by Jesus or living out the mission, we've got to use parable stories that people can relate to. And, um, and there's so many around, there's so many examples. You see, when Jesus spoke to fishermen, he was using stories about fishing. When he spoke to farmers, he was using stuff about farming and all those types of things. We've got to be people that um, know how to share stories that explain the beauty of Jesus. Let me give you an example of this when it comes to, say, your children. If you're driving along and it's just rained and you see a beautiful rainbow in the sky, don't ignore that. Use that as an opportunity to tell your children about what the rainbow means, the real meaning of the rainbow, not the deluded distortion that the world's trying to bring in about the rainbow, but the rainbow is about what? The promise of God, that he will never flood the whole earth again. And so we've got to look, when we speak to our children, look at things around us and bring Jesus into that place to teach them, to disciple them. Because as we are well aware, even by this example, the world is... The world can't create, all the world can do is distort. And you see, God created things to be beautiful, and let's keep the original context, the original context, and use it to tell people about Jesus. Amen? So we see he used parables to disciple. The second thing he did, he gave them opportunities to step out in faith. You think about all the stories, all the miracles he used the disciples, gave them opportunities to step out in faith and see what would happen? Prime example in Matthew 14 would be when 
Jesus calls Peter to come and walk upon the water. He gave him an opportunity to step out in faith. And you know the story goes, he took his eyes off Jesus, put on the waves, and he sunk, and then Jesus was there to help him up. But just think about that picture. He gave him an opportunity to fail in the safety of his environment, so if anything could happen, he could help him up. And I think when it comes to our children as well, it's okay if our children fail, because that's how they learn, but make sure it's in a safe environment so that they can learn from it and get better. And that's what we see there, that Jesus gave them opportunity to step out in faith and he taught them how to trust in God. He taught them how to be changed. He taught them so many great things. Stepping out in faith. Who knows that sometimes stepping out in faith can be scary? Yeah? If, you want to be, if you're an adrenaline junkie and you're like, I just, when I want to do things that push to the edge, step out in faith. Tell somebody about Jesus. Go and uh, be obedient to Christ. And I'll tell you what, it's more scarier than jumping out of an aeroplane, I believe. So who needs to jump out of aeroplanes where you can just share Jesus and, you know, all that. But, but I, I think sometimes we as Christians can easily slip into being consumer. And a good sign of a consumer Christian um, is somebody that's always about them, what they want. But there's something special about, and I believe it's the Christian way, about not about us, but all about Jesus, pointing people to him. So he gives us opportunities to step out in faith. The third thing he did as we read through scriptures is that he rebuked people. He rebuked his disciples. What did it say in Mark 16, 14? Still later, he appeared to the um, 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. You see, what you've got to understand, discipleship at times means that there's got to be correction. But, <laughs> but sometimes... Maybe all the time, we don't like being corrected. But the way we learn and the way that we become wise and the way that we grow, we need people to correct us, to rebuke us. And that's what we see that Jesus did to his disciples. He said, hey, your stubborn hearts, why? He rebuked them for, for thinking a wrong way. And he didn't do it because it was, uh, he was being harsh. He did it because he wanted the best for them. He was discipling them. He wanted them to rise up and be all who Christ has called them to be. You know, I think when it comes to our children, don't be scared to correct them. I know when they get over 18, it, it changes and they, it's more of a friendship type of thing. But when you're, they're in your household and, 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 you're, and they're young, there's some people that just don't correct their children. Come on, we've got to correct them. We've got to show them what's wrong and right. Discipling them so that they can be successful, giant killers for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. So we see that he taught with parables. We see that he, he, he uh, gave them opportunities to step out in faith and, and he, he corrected them, he rebuked them. Number four, he built relationship with them. Now I'm going to give you a line that I believe is very powerful, a one-liner. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So if you don't have relationship and you're just telling people what to do, they're not going to listen to it. But Jesus set an example when it was come to discipleship that it's through relationship. You've got to have relationship with people. And you know what? We are relational beings. The God that we serve, it's not about a religion as such. It's about a relationship. And it's through this relationship with God that he changes us from the inside out. And so when it comes to our world, as, even as parents, when it comes to our children, it's about having relationship so that you can teach them the rules so that they can live a good life. Now, when we have relationship, I want to give us just a, a little tool that I use um, when it comes to me in the relationships that I have and discipling. It could be with my kids or with staff or with different people in the church. Um, I, I've tweaked it a little bit. How I used to call it me, my church, my world, but I've changed it a bit to me, my Lord, my world. And... And, I, and I've based my conversations around these three things, me, my Lord, my world, or 
if you don't like that, those words, some people say, look back, look up, and look forward. And this is how I'd have a conversation with somebody. So when I'm thinking about me, I want to know how their life's going. How are you going with your walk with God? How are you going with the things that I spoke to you last time about that you said you would do? Um, is there anything we can pray for? I'm looking back. I'm looking at where they're at, what, what they've been doing. I'm caring for them. I'm praying for them in, in, in that moment. And then I'll switch into the look up and I'll say things like this. What has God been talking to you about? What has God been talking to you about? Or if I've got something on my heart, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, God's put this on my heart for you to hear. And so there's this, this new revelation, there's this new word, and we, and we discuss and we talk about it. And then we talk about the next stage, which is looking forward. All right, how can you now do what God is telling us to do? This, this, what God is speaking to you about, if it's to go and forgive somebody, how can you do that this week? And then I'll repeat that cycle. Next time I catch up with them, I'll go back to me. How'd you go when we spoke about you meeting that person and forgiving, whatever it may be? And see, so what we've got to understand, when you have relationship with people, with an intentional conversation, it helps you to begin to disciple. <clears throat> see, when it comes to your children, are you just going, how was your day today? And with no strategy... Now have a strategy, look back, look up, look forward, or me, my Lord, and my world. And keep that as a structure to disciple people around you because it happens relationally. See, some people go, well, I can put somebody through the 101 of discipleship and now they're a disciple of Christ. Now that, that's cold and I know that we can do programs and, it's, and, it's, and they, they're part of discipleship, but discipleship doesn't happen necessarily in the classroom, but through relationship. And you will find that you're actually discipling people even before they come to know Jesus Christ. So it's through relationship. So we see that Jesus had relationship. John 15, 12 and uh, 15 talks about that. Um, it says, this is the commandment, love each other. In the same way I have loved you, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in, the, in his slave. Now you are my friend, since I have told you everything the Father has told me. So what's he saying? That, that language he's using is he's, he's got relationship with his disciples and he's taking them on a journey to be all that they're called to be. Amen? Do you, are, you, are you with me? Are you following this today? Is this helpful? discipleship this is what should be exciting all of us it's what we're called to do he told us to go and make disciples the fifth thing he did is he always used scripture see sometimes when people disciple this is the difference between a disciple of jesus and a disciple of something else is we can be discipled in people's opinions and preferences and we can be drawn to different things and that's a disciple of that like if, if I can talk about um, rugby league, I can talk about that and, and I can disciple you in that and you can become great in knowing everything about rugby league and you're a disciple of rugby league. But we don't want to have people discipled in, well, you can't have interests, but ultimately what we want to do, we want to disciple people with scripture, God's way, what he says. Because you see the world that we're living in, there's a lot of opinions out there and, they, and some of them even have a little bit of truth that makes sense but they're not leading you to Jesus. They're leading you to self-help and self-reliance and reliance of other, on others when we've got to realize that God is the one that we rely upon and he uses people on that journey as well. So he used scripture. You even see different um, stories when he say, you used to hear that if, uh, what's one example? Oh, did I write one down here? I didn't even put one down here. But say, like you used to hear, um, um, uh, what was the one I was reading for? Anyway, you can read it in the Bible yourself. You'll find plenty of them. <laughs> but you see, he goes, you used to hear about this, but I tell you. So it's talking about if you used to uh, commit adultery. And he says, well, I tell you, if you even look at somebody and think of that in your, in your mind, you've committed it. And so he was using scripture, Old Testament scripture, to pave a way for the new covenant, the New Testament way. And so what we've got to realize, now we're blessed. We have the New Testament. We have the new covenant. It's there for us. Now we've just got to live it out, use scripture, point people back to the word. I've even had conversations with people lately and they've attacked and they've carried on. And I would say something like this, where in the Bible does it say what you're doing right now? And it keeps them straight in their trap. It's like, stop. 
what they've done, they've got an offense and they've snowballed and they've created their own theology, which is causing them to live more bound and pulling them away from God rather than humbling themselves, picking up scripture and doing it God's way. And that's what we've got to realize. We're discipling people in the word of God, in the context word of God. Not just taking one verse out of context, but taking it. See, I would encourage you when it comes to you, if you, hear, if you read one verse, read the whole chapter to get the context of it. Just don't take that one verse or that one word. Read the whole chapter to get the context of what it's saying. So when it comes to reading scripture, I've got this new um, tool that I've been using to help me when it comes to me reading my scripture. And I want to encourage you to do this as well. It's, it's the acronym SPEC, S P. E-C. You've been in church for a while, you've probably heard of this before. But I know there's all different acronyms. There's SOAP, there's the scripture, um, observation, apps, application, prayer. There's all these different things. But I, I'm enjoying this spec one. When you're reading the word, think of spec. Is there a sin to avoid in what I'm reading? P, is there a promise to believe? E, is there an example to follow? And C, is there a command to obey? If you have these three things as you're reading, is there a sin that I need to avoid? Is there a promise I need to believe and hold on to? Is there an example I need to follow? Do I need to bring an alignment with my actions? Or is there a command I need to obey? And pretty much what we're talking about through this whole series are the commands of Christ. Everyone we've spoken about is from the mouth of Jesus telling us, even today's one, go and make disciples. Jesus commands us to do it. Number six. We've got to prepare them to be independent. See, sometimes people are very needy and they want people to be dependent on them. But if we're going to create strong, well-rounded disciples, strong, well-rounded children, it's not about making them dependent on us, but independent and dependent on Jesus. Because we can't always be there, but God always is. His Word always is. His Holy Spirit always is. So we've got to prepare people to be independent. You see people that, because of their, their, their shortcomings, they want to be needed and they like to feel all these types of things. But when it comes to the make disciples of Christ, ultimately, and that's what Jesus did, he trained them, he equipped them, and then he sent them out to go and make disciples. And that commission he's given us, he sent us to go. To go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go knowing that he is with us always, even to the ends of the age so that they can do great things for God in Jesus' name. So we see he taught through parables, gave them opportunities to step out in faith. He rebuked or corrected them. He built relationship with them. He gave them scripture, and he prepared them to be independent. Now, why don't we make disciples? Some people do, but why don't we? Why don't you, if you've never done it, step out and begin to make disciples? Tell people about Jesus. Help them follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, live out the mission. The reason why most people won't do it is because they say, I'm not ready. I don't know enough scripture. I'm not qualified enough. Can I tell you something? Read through the Bible and look at the people that God used. None of them were qualified. They were the reject, they were the ones that shouldn't be used. We're just going to make it simple. You're not telling people what you don't know. You're telling people what you do know. This is what Jesus has done in my life. This is what I was like before I knew Jesus. When I come to know Jesus, and now this is the way I live. Before I knew God, how I come to know God, and now what my life is like. Could be in family, could be in marriage, could be in whatever it is. Just use what God has given you to help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and live out the mission. Some people think I'm not ready. Some people think I'm too old. Titus 2.4 said, These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. And you see other scriptures talking about it. Older people, disciple. You become fathers. You become grandparents. Use that experience, the things that you've done right, the things that you've done wrong, the challenges you've gone through. Use that to encourage and champion people on. Some people think this, I don't need somebody to disciple me. 
Can I tell you something? We all need somebody to disciple us. We all need it. People that say that are people that are full of their own ego and pride. They have to do it all their own way. We all need somebody to continually disciple us, correct us, rebuke us, encourage us, love us, point us to Jesus. You know, you, you see even an example, you think, think a football player, like my kids play football, rugby league, not soccer, not any other sport, rugby league, the one that's going to be played in heaven for all eternity. They have one coach for the whole team. You know, when you watch this NRL on TV, they have a coach for everything. So it seems like the better you get and the longer you've been doing something for, the more coaching you actually need to become better. So don't think you don't need to be discipled. And the last two things is this. How do we disciple? By our example and with our words. Do as I do and do as I say. Do as I do and do as I say. They go together. You can't just say, do as I say and not as I do. But we've got to realize that our example, disciples. Our words, disciple. Let's do all we can to let our actions and let our words glorify God. Let me, let me give you this one thing before I close. I wrote this down. It was too good not to say. If people followed your example, if people followed your example, take this personally, would they become more like Jesus? If not, make some adjustment so that your example glorifies God and your words glorify God in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's all close our eyes and bow our heads for a few moments. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're here. Jesus, I thank you that you've made a way for us. Lord, as we've been talking about your church and the health of it, talking about believing and be baptized and repenting, about prayer and today about disciples, help us all to take this personally, God. It's not for somebody else just to do, but it's for us to do as well. Help us to disciple our families to disciple those that are in our worlds. Lord, we just thank you that as we do it, we know we're not doing it in our own strength, but you've given us the Holy Spirit to empower us and help us. That you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. Help us, God, to be your church as we go. Help us to disciple. In Jesus' name. Yeah, just while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, I want to give people an opportunity here today that maybe you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you haven't turned from your ways and put your faith, your belief in God. Today's the day. Don't put it off any longer. God's been on your case for long enough. He's been knocking on your heart. He's been put, putting people around you to get you to stop doing it that way and follow Jesus. The way that he has for you is better. You don't need to do it on your own, but you can do it in relationship with God. So over this place today, you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time. Well, maybe you need to come back to him today. I'm going to give you a moment to respond. And the way that you can respond at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to stop doing it my way. I feel that knock. I feel that prompting of my heart. I've got to respond. I've got to repent from that and I've got to believe. So if that's you or no one's looking around, come on, don't put it off any longer. Today is the day. Count of three, lift your hand up. Ready? One, two, three. Three, if that's you all over this place, you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or coming back. Come on, lift it up high. Keep it up long enough. High enough for me to see it. Awesome. It's great. You know, I didn't see any hands go up today, but we're going to say this prayer anyway. 
It goes like this. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I believe that he rose again. Now I confess that I'm a sinner and I repent of that. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, let's thank God for salvation in his name. Amen. Can we all stand for a few moments? What are we going to do? We're going to pray for people in our worlds that are away from God. Now, we've just heard today how, how we can make disciples. People say, oh, I might not be ready. No, you're ready. You know Jesus, you've got what it takes. Just tell people about what God's done in your life. And you know, one of the powerful things we can do, we can bring people that don't know God to church where they hear the message of Jesus every week. So bring people to a place where they can hear about God. So what we're going to do, we're going to pray right now for people in our worlds that are away from Jesus. We're going to mention them by name. And we're going to go out this week and we're going to go and be intentional with our conversations to share our faith. Invite them to a place where they can hear about God. Because what you've got to understand is, is there is a heaven and a hell. There is a heaven and a hell. Jesus has paid the price so that we didn't have to live separate from Him in a place called hell. But we can have a relationship with Him. We can live with Him for all eternity in heaven. I think sometimes you forget about the reality of that. We think, oh no, it's all right, everyone will be okay. Well, no, it's not. Do we actually believe what the Word of God says? Because if we do, there needs to be a fresh hunger to share our faith and to make disciples, to go, to go and do what God has called us to do. What's the command He's told us to do today? To go and make disciples, teaching them about Jesus. So come on, let's pray for a few moments. Let's lift up these people in our worlds that are away from God, that need to know Him. So God, we lift up every single person in our world that's away from You. God, we know that it's Your will for none to perish but all to come into relationship with you. And Father, we just pray today that you would help us to be more intentional, that your Holy Spirit would convict us and, and remind us to go and make disciples, go and tell people about Jesus, go and have intentional conversations with our children and the people that are around us. Lord, we just pray them, pray them into your kingdom right now, put people around them, God, that can encourage them and point them to you. And God, we just pray that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for salvation to hit households. We pray for a fresh hunger and a passion upon your church to go and make disciples, to go and tell people about Jesus. So we just ask that you continue to do a great work in people's lives, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, come on. <laughs> Can we thank God in advance? What is he going to do?